Today is an exciting day. Because of your participation in health and attending this program, together we're making a difference, a difference that is improving health and care globally. Welcome to CHIME's second session at Health Virtual. My name is Jonathan Fritz, and I'm the Chief Innovation Officer at CHIME. For those of you who aren't aware of CHIME, we're a global healthcare leadership organization originally founded as a professional association for hospital chief information officers. Our membership is now more than 5,000 executives across nearly 60 countries, with more than 160 partner companies in our CHIME Foundation. Our organization has grown significantly over the past 28 years since our founding, and our members are truly the leaders in digital health globally. We're excited to partner with Health again this year. It furthers the goals of CHIME Innovation to deliver innovation education to healthcare leaders and to facilitate innovation in healthcare that improves health and care globally. As a recovering patent and startup business attorney, I believe strongly in the impact healthcare innovation can deliver to us all. And I also believe Healthcare is personal. It brings to mind one of my first experiences with the healthcare industry. I was an eight year old dental assistant. My dad, the dentist, was caring for his patient, who happened to be my mom and also a registered nurse. Definitely an interesting situation for an eight year old. But normally, when we'd go to my dad's office for family dental work, I was excited to raid the goodie bin. At least that is what I called it. A big bucket of toys for all the kids going to see the dentist. However, that day, I recall seeing computers throughout the office. My dad had just installed PCs at each of the 10 dentist stations within his office. The year was 1985. I remember being surprised that he could access information about his patients on that computer. It was mind boggling to me. As it turns out, the information was limited at first. It was started with patient billing codes, go figure. But eventually it led to accessing x-rays and the full patient record while my dad was caring for his patients and not just family members on the weekends. My dad was certainly on the forefront of digital health. I'd like to consider him an early adopter a consumer of digital health, and an engaged clinician. We've come a long way since then, and it's one of the reasons why I'm so excited for this session, the engaged clinician as consumer. It builds on digital health's momentum, and in particular, our first session, which focused on the reality that patients are consumers of healthcare, and innovation, particularly post-COVID, is accelerating that engagement. In this session, we're going to hear from Dr. James Madara, CEO of the American Medical Association, a great friend to CHIME. He'll share some trends that he's seen in the midst of COVID and some of the practical approaches to training and education that will further enable clinicians to be engaged consumers of digital health. Next, we'll hear from Dr. Sangeeta Reddy, Joint Managing Director of Apollo Hospitals Group another great friend of CHIME, and a partner of ours in our development of global innovation labs and centers. Dr. Reddy will touch upon a few specific examples where innovation is enabling clinicians to make more informed decisions and provide access to actionable data and analysis for improved care. And the third segment of this session is our very own Russ Branzell, CEO and president of CHIME. He's going to provide a sneak preview of our digital health most wired results. If you're not familiar with it, please check it out. This year's data includes over 750 submitted surveys representing over 30,000 healthcare facilities in 14 countries. It's very interesting data in areas of value-based care, population health, patient engagement, and many other digital health insights. It's truly remarkable. I hope you enjoy the session. 
I hope you enjoy the day. And please stick around for our next sessions on public policy and the future of health and care. Finally, I personally invite you to join me at the end of our program today, 3 p.m. Eastern, for a 30-minute live Q&A session with Teresa Meadows, CIO, Cook Children's Health, and Mark Probst, 2020 CIO of the Year, former CIO of Intermountain Healthcare, current CIO of, at LK, and both of these are very good friends of mine and Chime. Enjoy the day and be well. I'm Dr. Jim Madeira. I started my career in medicine leading a multi-institutional research center at Harvard and then serving as Dean and CEO of the health system at University of Chicago. Now I'm in my 10th year as CEO of the American Medical Association. At the AMA, we strive to live our mission to promote the art and science of medicine and the betterment of public health. My comments today will focus on the importance of digital advances in healthcare advances related to the AMA's own work. I'll begin with detailed consideration of the general topic of telemedicine, then touch on a small number of other digital health themes of interest to the AMA. First, we often fail to realize that physicians actually adopt new technologies rapidly, whether that technology be robotic surgery, other new instrumentation, or telehealth. The secret sauce for adoption is that the technology works as intended, that it's efficient, that it's effective in improving patient care, and it's recognized as such by payers. The urgency of adoption of digital technology was magnified in the COVID-19 pandemic. Before COVID, we were already experiencing significant movement toward telemedicine, both patients and physicians warm to the convenience that remote physician visits can offer. Rate limiting steps to adoption in this pre-pandemic period though, included how one could capitalize the equipment needed, how to incorporate this new workflow stream into practices, and importantly, whether this new approach would allow practice financial sustainability. But even with these early barriers, progress was being made. For example, in 2016, 14% of physicians conducted virtual visits with patients, though typically in small amounts. By 2019, the number of physicians with telemedicine experience surpassed 25%. But again, the volumes were typically low in any one practice. That all dramatically changed with COVID. Now, just a year later, 90% of physicians have connected with patients remotely. Half of these physicians deployed telehealth for the first time following the onset of the pandemic. Based on multiple conversations I've had with both individual providers and institutions, the increased use in telehealth and practices since February increased not by two to threefold, nor even by tenfold. Rather, the increase often approximated a hundredfold. So not only did use of telemedicine become common, but in any one practice, the volumes increased exponentially. I've even argued that for telemedicine as being integrated into practice, this field advanced 10 years in that most dramatic 10 week post pandemic period. Many practices, both individual and institutional, went from almost purely face-to-face -to, -face to almost purely telehealth during this short period. Adoption was also enormously facilitated by introduction of payment parity through Medicare and relaxation of other restrictions. Now, we'll need to carry this progress forward, and it looks promising that we will. But to do so, we need to maintain some of those flexibilities in platform and payment. Also needed going forward is to better understand and effectively incorporate two different work streams, face-to-face -face and virtual, into the same practice. And understand what can be best done by telemedicine, 
and what can be best done face to face. Now I'll give a, a personal example. Two weeks ago, I had arthroscopy for a knee procedure to grow new cartilage. Yesterday, I had my virtual follow-up with my orthopedic surgeon. Not only did I get to briefly meet his wife and new dog, but in conversation, he indicated that with the right imaging procedure, which he can order and then analyze remotely, coupled with a virtual visit, he now feels able to get the right diagnosis in nine of every 10 cases on average. And he was astounded by this. And he wouldn't have predicted this pre-pandemic until he was forced into this new venue. Importantly, we will also need to work collaboratively to ensure that challenges of efficiency, efficacy, privacy, and equity do not become barriers to widespread telehealth adoption. We can't have such promising new technology be an inadvertent Trojan horse which amplifies the lack of health equity and the unevenness of access that the pandemic highlighted. We know, for example, that disparities exist which serve to make chronic disease more prevalent in several of our underserved populations. Telehealth could be an incredibly powerful tool in caring for patients with various forms of chronic disease, both in underserved as well as the general population. And the treatment of these chronic diseases overall absorbs more than 80% of US healthcare spending today. This care continuity in chronic disease would be a wonderful opportunity for telehealth, as long as we can discern how telehealth can be used equitably and evenly. And of course, physicians who provide clinical services in telehealth must responsibly uphold the standards of professionalism, just as expected during in-person visits. AMA's new telehealth implementation playbook, which is freely available on our website, outlines a clear, efficient path to rapid, scaled implementation of audio and visual visits, along with a wealth of institutional knowledge and best practice that's curated by experts in this field. Another significant barrier to wider adoption of telemedicine had been limits where patients could be physically located in order to receive these services under Medicare rules. With the AMA's urging, CMS temporarily removed these restrictions, which meant that Medicare patients could now receive telemedicine services from the comfort and privacy of their homes, no matter where those homes were located. The AMA strongly supports this change, which we'd like to have permanent, and we'll continue to work with Congress and policymakers at CMS to resolve such questions. Commercial payers are already appreciating the positive contributions of telemedicine as well. We also launched an AMA-led collaborative toward this year, the end of this year, uh, called the Telehealth Initiative. It utilizes a pilot group of more than 20 varied physician practices that we supply with expert coaching and that we analyze in order to further improve best practices for telehealth implementation. And I should mention Dr. Michael Tati, head of our practice sustainability unit and Laurie McGraw is head of the health solutions unit and all of their unit colleagues as being critically important in the AMA's telehealth efforts. Now let me mention some other digital needs that extend from telehealth generally. We already covered the qualities of ease for patients and physicians, attractiveness for continuity of care, less need for bricks and mortar, et cetera. But when it comes right down to it, the amount of time spent virtually in a telemedicine visit is almost identical to that in a face-to-face -face visit. And some of that time is due to the lack of optimal data organization. And this simply highlights the need for better data organization in both cases. But since telemedicine is a new work stream, it's perhaps more permissive to thinking through new data management approaches 
with patient physicians encounters. One area related to this is the need to be able to effectively and efficiently obtain accurate biosensor data from remote sites. The AMA's Integrated Health Model Initiative, led by Dr. Tom Giannulli, focuses on this area. Now already developed and soon to be tested in the wild is a self-monitored blood pressure solution. This solution allows digital confirmation of the used use of an approved cuff, digital patient attestation to assure the measurement is taken correctly, digital means of separating signal from noise over time, and digital methods of transporting these data and organizing them in the electronic record, all without paper shuffle or the other inhibiting 20th century legacies that currently exist. Now, given that high blood pressure is the number one killer in our society, and home blood pressures more accurately portray the true physiological state, this would be a most important advance. It becomes even more important if we can extend seamless remote data transfer and record integration from remote sensors generally. As you can see, the work in the digital space and telehealth is critical to the AMA. So critical that for even more complex digital solutions, the AMA launched Health 2047, an innovation company which might be viewed as creating commercial ventures related to the strategic priorities of the AMA. Health 2047 was launched in 2016, is located in Menlo Park, the heart of Silicon Valley, and has already been spun off five companies. I'll mention a new one a company called Medcurio, which you can find at medcurio.com. Medcurio offers advanced data integration technology and customized APIs to transform the experience of assessing healthcare data in real time. And it does so without heavy implementation, maintenance burdens, and costs. The platform generates codeless APIs that perform queries and data retrieval functions for meaningful and concise data retrieval efficiently and effectively, and also provides a virtual data science function. Buzz Stewart is the founding CEO of this product. This product to simply make easier and less expensive interrogation of data from data warehouses. That product, Medcurio, is now in the field with early customers. Yet another example of the coming digital medicine world is in the area of lifelong physician education. The AMA's Digital Education Hub was launched the year before last. This ed hub has all AMA educational content, including repurpose JAMA, Journal of the American Medical Association, and JAMA Network learning materials, all in digital form. We had hoped this new digital platform would be sufficiently attractive that others would want to use it in a co-branded fashion. That now seems to be the case. We now have several subspecialty societies on this backbone. More will be migrating in this year and next year. But we also have a series of medical specialty boards and state licensing boards as well. The vision is to bring together as possible overall medical education, including CME credit, state licensing, et cetera, in a seamless paperless fashion so education can be more effect effective and efficient and have a lot less friction. Also in collaboration with our innovation company, Health 2047, we are now envisioning an AI driven extension of the ed hub in which the electronic record of a specific physician could be interrogated in order to precisely define the characteristics of patients and disease burdens in that exact practice. This would allow development of bespoke educational content crafted on the actual patient panel that that physician sees. The AMA is excited with these and other digital opportunities for the future of healthcare. We think there's great promise to create a modern health system that is more affordable, more accessible, and simply works better for patients 
as well as physicians. Namaste and hello. It's a pleasure to be speaking to you at Chime. And let me begin by congratulating all of you for the fantastic work that you do and thanking you for this opportunity to communicate with you. It's my pleasure to be speaking today on the engaged clinician as consumer, building a digital health momentum. But to begin with, I think it's very important for me to share uh, about my organization. So Apollo Hospitals that you can see um, our vision and our chairman who's coming up on the screen here uh, began in 1983 in a city called Chennai, which is in the south of India. And uh, he gave us this concept of really and shared with us the fact that we must find a way to bring healthcare of international standard within the reach of everyone. And this vision really has led to the creation of over 10,000 beds, medical schools, nursing schools, uh, over 500 clinics, uh, education systems online as well as offline, over 3,800 pharmacies, corporate wellness, uh, home healthcare, and uh, a telemedicine initiative, which is now really looking at telehealth and remote care. Uh, but all 70,000 of the Apollo family members commit to, core, to working together to bring this vision come alive. Uh, I want to share with you an example of how we did this. Uh, Project Coverage is our initiative, which we put together during COVID times. And I think no conversation uh, during this time is complete without talking about uh, COVID response. So the first thing we did was find a way to give credible information to people around the clock, 24 by 7. But the call center was back-ended by an entire triage system, as well as the mobile app, which enabled people people to take a risk score. And then uh, we not only enabled online consults, booking of medicines, door delivery of medicines, but also education about the, uh, the what COVID was, how you could prevent it, what kind of steps you needed to take, and a COVID risk scan, which over 18.3 million people took. We upgraded and ramped up testing centers. We opened up fever clinics, over 150 of them. We innovated to create a concept called Stay I, which is Stay Isolated. And here, dedicated facilities were created by partnering with hotel rooms. And we put a telemedicine overlay on top. So we monitored them 24 by 7, delivered medicines, had a doctor visit them just once a day or a nurse or a paramedic and allowed them to stay isolated, be monitored and shift to the hospital only if they needed. This greatly prevented our hospitals from getting overcrowded. Uh, we used a similar concept uh, in stay isolated at home as well. And finally, of course, treatment was the most important thing. We committed 2,500 beds, of which 1,000 were ICU uh, beds, uh, looked at appropriate stocking, tracked upgradation of protocols, created the Red Book, and have uh, brought almost 29 versions of updation of treatment protocols, whether it was HCQ, remdesivir, steroids, uh, keeping a patient prone, when to do ventilation, and all these were shared with the community. And IT has played a critical role in enabling us to scale all these initiatives. Uh, and that's why I shared this with you, because finally, the power of technology is only in as much as the number of lives you're able to touch, the number of people you're able to save, or the number of people you're able to educate. Uh, but moving on from coverage and coming back to, I think, what we're talking about today, which is the evolving practice of medicine and the very critical role of the clinician. I think clinicians who were adopting IT first saw themselves as people who were exploring and said, okay, I'm an early adopter. Then they got into it and began to enjoy this. So they were the players in the field. And these uh, people were really the front runners of adoption of electronic health records, etc. They became influencers. And this curve, various solutions grew across this curve, whether it was the EMR or the you know, multiple device integration. 
and their adoption really enabled this whole ecosystem to come alive for patients uh, to come alive for hospitals and doctors ability to look at data to use social media tools to bring in their patients to understand the power of clinical decision support to share their insights with other uh, colleagues to combine the phr and the emr together so that we created a new layer of continuum of care and involvement of the patient customized treatment pathways and the disruptors then went many steps further to look at case load optimization and efficiency planning for their hospitals and hospital systems so theaters got less crowded uh, but did the same if not more work uh the their waiting rooms got smarter and finally decision support analysts digital influencers and new protocols this is really the clinic and the clinician of the future but it is the doctors who have created the path enabled the journey and will really be showing the way and so i firmly believe that it is the clinician's view which is the most appropriate the most important and the final driver and they look for simplistic iterative and functional ways to work because they have so much going on in their lives their capability to do uh, enable the adoption to use data in a continuous manner so that their patient data is usable by the nurse by the paramedic into a good ecosystem effective communication is capable between all the care caregivers at every level of care and also when you shift from location to location it also enables appropriate resource utilization and finally this important thing that all of us are looking for which is value based healthcare so that the effectiveness of treatment improves the morbidity and the length of stay can, comes down and of course costs need to come down so that we can serve more and more people this is the clinician's point of view which is driving the way we look at things but i want to take this a little further because that was a very functional point of view here i'm sharing what i believe is really the future of healthcare which is that biology bites and bandwidth are transforming care and let's talk about biology and bites when we understand uh, the precursors or the pre underlying conditions uh, which lead to having a disease or a complication like cardiovascular when we put down all the causative factors and then we analyze data in a large pool we're able to get far more insightful into creating risk prediction paradigms and that's what we did in our cardiovascular risk scoring so this cardiovascular risk scoring which was created or enabled by the analysis of over 60000 patients who had had our health check and then subsequently a certain percentage of them went on to have a cardiac incident so we tried to analyze what were the risk factors known and unknown which showed up and it showed us that systolic blood pressure has a differential impact versus cyst um, um uh excuse me for that one and it showed us that uh if you look at the the blood pressure it's not a composite number uh diastolic blood pressure has less impact than systolic blood pressure and yes clinicians may have read this in one paper among the thousands of papers they've read but to bring this up as an important tracking mechanism it is the risk score and an it enabled system which is enabling them to do that and today i'm happy to say that doctors all across the apollo system and we have over 7000 doctors probably about 450 of them are cardiologists all of them are using this risk score and we're now sharing this with a larger ecosystem of general practitioners so that they can bring this to bear in their decision making about the treatment of a patient the other power of this of using the bites and the analysis is that we can have a more proactive view on healthcare rather than constantly looking in the rear view mirror we do audits we do mortality and morbidity review but all that is about things which happened in the past imagine looking front and forward and saying because they have all these his potential risk of having a cardiac disease is 70% if he brings his weight down it goes down to 55% if he stops smoking it drops dr drastically to 15% and i'll further lower that by giving him some hypertension medication this is the proactive forward looking view of healthcare the data enabled it enabled health systems are allowing and these can work only when the doctors not just use them but first they need to build them 
these algorithms are born out of doctors knowledge and capability and this is the power of the clinician's view using this i want to share that also clinicians are driving adoption on telephone enabled uh, telemedicine so here we we train and onboard the doctor uh, we open up their slot so that whenever they want to come online uh, we bring patients onto the platform and they are able to click book an appointment go ahead and see their doctor uh, post all the uh, the findings into their personal health record and of course uh, order medicines or tests and finally continuously view this and the doctor can post his follow up action plan and care plan on to the phr for the crm team to then pick up and start taking forward this not only enhances the efficiency of a doctor's daytime but it actually allows him to open up and be available to a large field of patients uh, which we can do through marketing as well so i think making remote care mainstream uh, and making doctor availability 24/7 and ubiquitous for the patient is really what we're looking for on this app called apollo 24/7 another very important aspect which we have co ideated with our clinicians is the concept of a connected room and here we remove repetitive work which a nurse may need to do whether it's uh, uh, the vitals or glucose monitoring or patient fall or early warning scoring uh, and bring this with wearables connected into the hospital information system and make it online and continuous and wireless uh, so this is truly the the future of what we're looking at besides of course the connected room has simple uh, things so that uh, the patient doesn't need to bother the nurse for things from um, uh, if they want water or they want their room cleaned or they want to know about their billing details so this capability of creating a connected room again is one of the factors which is driving doctors to adopt because what we have enabled here is that we're now beginning to say that we don't need to do code, code blue as frequently as we did before because the early warning systems of the continuous monitoring of the patient will actually warn warn the nursing station and the doctor much before this scenario actually happens so this is another example of proactive healthcare which has actually been designed by a doctor i think doctors love the fact that they can be in many places at many times so the eicu system which is enabling our intensivists uh, to talk to super specialty hospitals outside of our own hospital talk to teaching and medical hospitals talk to small nursing homes in rural areas uh, this is something which has uh, in its current form uh, we have now found that uh, we have prevented over 5000 adverse events using the same concept of technology we have a vision for the country that we will find a way to think outside of the hospital and put doctors knowledge into primary healthcare centers we're calling it phc the community healthcare centers and do uh, public private partnership models of tele advice tele medicine connected device uh, and use this smart enabled world to bring virtual consults point of care testing chatbots all to bear into the healthcare ecosystem so that we can just deliver better care uh, whether it's inside the hospital or outside and truly enable a continuum of care many of these which will start by uh, telemedicine enabled doctor uh, manned models will soon move Uh, to chatbot enabled ai enabled models where much of the communication up to a certain degree will happen using technology but again adoption which is the relevant clinical factors on which you build the algorithms how do you use this who at which level do you escalate to a human being framework for these can only be built by clinicians and adopted by clinician there are a few models of what we're doing here uh, the cardiac risk scan i spoke to you about there's a very powerful tool on antibiotic uh, stewardship we're working on pre diabetes screen screening we of course did the covid scan which i told you about this is just a, a small uh, peep into some of the capability of an ai enabled model behind a doctor i truly believe that the future of healthcare 
where it used to be very hospital centric then we had to link the the pharmacy the diagnostic uh, the lab the ambulance the teleradiology but everything was built around the hospital and then uh, the hospital needed to link with uh, home nursing facilities with uh, nursing homes with uh, urgent care centers and again the data needed to be connected uh, i believe that the patient and the doctor are truly at the center of this ecosystem and that ability to think and build around the patient need but be driven by which stage of escalation and which technology gets used by the doctors in sight is truly the future of medicine because then doctors will take care of patients and their families in a far more proactive uh, manner which delivers a higher value of care i also think that this ecosystem is not staying static anymore it is powerful and the doctors at the center of it but the doctors now needing to think through this new environment which is not just hospital centric but as we spoke about comes outside of the hospital and is enabled by virtual consults telemedicine connected devices people are wearing them on their wrist uh, they are carrying them in their phones so this and again the doctors at the middle of it and which data flows from this system into the hospital system will be controlled by the doctor and very importantly the data will get converted into insights and actionable care points through analytics ai ml and the communication layer or the presentation layer or the action layer will get built out using maybe chatbots or call centers but will be designed by the doctors and then pharmacogenetics uh, various science and data related uh, clinical practice will combine with continuum of care to give us this future of healthcare but very much driven by the doctor and delving deeper into this precision medicine is really where we are going with the future where uh, can we go one slide back please uh one second on precision medicine uh where the pharmacogenetics the science of the entire scenario will will really drive uh what is happening uh in terms of preventive care personalized medicine of course digital healthcare but also mis- machine intelligence in terms of predictive analytics uh cognitive building the algorithms all towards this new future of a healthier individual uh, using technology and the genomic re- revolution combined together uh, to create healthier individuals and it is said that a lot of what is happening in the real world has already been dreamt up or thought about uh, in pop culture or in the movies and therefore uh i'm sharing with you the fact that we loved uh, our earlier versions of of say the flintstones but we also saw jetsons and so while uh, you know fred flintstone is extremely happy with his car the jetsons are offering him a brand new solution and this is the transition point where the doctor is saying maybe i have some new tools and i will be the ones who adopt these new tools because the technology world is enabling these for me but i just want to end by saying that the doctors will use the new tools but the clinician will always remain in the driving seat so let us adopt and move on to this exciting digital journey and let clinicians remain in the driving seat of choosing how technology helps them to treat patients and move from patients to treat healthy individuals and then treat communities as a whole so that we can keep populations healthy and enable this to happen at a higher quality with less cost i want to congratulate all of you at chime uh for all the work that you're doing and say that we're all on this common journey and this journey is about one thing which is most important and we are all committed to preserving that which is priceless which is the human body and humanity namaste and thank you very much well hi this is russ branzell ceo and president of chime what an amazing pleasure it is to be part of the health virtual conference uh even more it is absolutely humbling and honoring to follow two of my favorite people in the world Dr. Madera and Dr. Reddy both of which are truly truly some of the most innovative and thoughtful people in the industry so to follow them is uh is quite humbling quite a pleasure to spend some time with you today talking about and really the purpose of today's presentation or time with you 
is to talk about one of our programs we have within CHIME. If you don't know who CHIME is, uh, CHIME is the Professional Association, the College of Healthcare Information Management Executives, quite a mouthful there, as you would expect. That's why we just refer to it as CHIME. Uh, we're the Professional Association for Healthcare IT, Digital Health Executives across the world. Uh, we have members across every state in the United States and now in over 55 countries, probably 57 as of today, and chapters in 11 other countries that are out there. So we do a pretty intensive uh, deployment of thought leadership and benchmarking and programs, and that's really what we're here to talk about today. It's one of those programs. About three years ago, we acquired the most wired program. Uh, from our partners, the American Hospital Association. And we'll talk a little bit about what we're seeing in that and where the program is today. Maybe just a little sneak pre preview of some of the stuff we're seeing as we're getting ready to roll out the uh, full results of this program. Part of this is really to take it in, in context, obviously, and thank you to all of you for all the work you're doing in the industry, no matter what your job is. Uh, this, these are trying times, um, these are difficult times. And we know we're going through multiple waves. Uh, we've seen even recently from our partners in the UK and Ireland continuing shutdown. Uh, we've seen in our partners south of the equator in Australia what happens when flu and COVID come together. Uh, we know these are tough times and it will be continue to be tough times for a considerable amount. What's really amazing to us though is despite all this going on, we're seeing people step up from a digital health perspective in ways even we couldn't dream of. Uh, with our program that we have. The Digital Health Most Wired program that we took over and, and reinvented uh, really three years ago uh, is intended really to do one thing, to give people great benchmarking data and look at best practice, but most importantly, to elevate the game of our health and care communities, providers, organizations across the globe. And that really is our intent. Uh, we don't charge people to take that survey. We give them free reports. The whole intent is to get in their hands the best information they can possibly have. The program has grown considerably just over the last few years. Uh, we've seen quite a bit of, of interest in the program as we've really provided that kind of survey and benchmarking that people can really grow their organization on. In particular, just in the last three years, the survey did represent in 2018 a little over 2,000 entities uh, as part of the survey process. That number grew, grew to over 16,000 entities last year. And we're pleased to note, uh, as you can see right on there, the number of facilities and entities represented is over 30,000 entities across the globe, including many new programs that we launched, including last year, the first ever survey for digital health and long-term care and strategy for those areas. We try to provide the very best information we possibly can for those individuals and those organizations. And again, this survey is not stagnant. Every single year we improve the program, we increase the bar, we raise that bar up. The whole intent is as the industry changes, we need to measure that change. And it may be in some cases even drive that change. Now there are always those that really set themselves apart. And this year is no different. We have, eight organizations that have achieved the highest level possible. Very similar for those that are familiar with the Malcolm Baldrige process, we have bands and levels of performance. These eight organizations achieved the highest level possible, level 10 in our digital health survey program. It's a great credit to them that even during these amazingly trying times, they were able to continue to push forward with the digital strategy for the purpose of improving their organizations, and the care they deliver to their patients. So great, great congratulations to them, uh, to all the things that they are doing, and um, in particular to uh, Avera, Cedar sinai and UC Health, who are now the two-time receiver of the level 10 on there. So great credit to them. But let's talk a little bit about the results. We're gonna give you a little sneak preview into what we're seeing in some of the results that are coming out. We do a couple different levels. Each organization gets a very detailed report, benchmark report of their organization and all their entities and where they are racked and stacked against everybody else in the industry, including some best practices. Um, but we also create what's called the community report or an aggregate report for everyone to be able to learn from and really benchmark in the industry. We've already gotten a preview of that. You're getting one of the first shots seen in the entire industry of that. 
And as you would expect, one of the things you would expect to get again to see really is that telehealth. Telehealth has continued to grow. It has continued to really set the pace. Now you can say that was probably due to COVID and you can see that market increase in the results that are there. I think that is true. The huge spike was, but as you can see though, organizations were already participating in 19. Why is this so important? Because when you look at this from that perspective, you realize the foundation was being led by those digital health leaders, not just the great IT leaders out there, but the organizations themselves that really took serious their digital health strategy and realizing that we were moving to a more digital world and that their strategies were driving that performance. So when the call came to move to telehealth, many organizations, all this was was a scaling process that had to do, they had to do to meet the needs of the clinicians and the patients in their communities and those that they serve. It's really a great testament. We can even show more in this area to prove the fact that this is a consistent trend line. Matter of fact, if you look at this by functional area, by location of service, all were on this journey. Again, smaller incremental gains from 18 to 19, and the one, 2%, maybe as much as 4% for patient home access. But even if you look now into the 19 to 20 scale on here, you will see that market change that is there. Now the question will be, where will it level off as we return to what anybody would describe out there to the next level of normal? Uh, I don't like calling it new normal. I'll just say it's the next level of normal as we move forward. We don't believe in any way that this is gonna return back to historic numbers. Matter of fact, there will be a level that levels off on probably far exceeding the original benchmarks in 18 and 19 that are out there. And some organizations that are returning back to a little bit more in-person, in-face uh, clinical care and their organizations are confirming that to us now. And obviously we'll see that in the 21 survey that we put out there, kind of where that benchmark in that area is as we go forward. But one of the things we want to stress in this survey is this is not a technology survey. This is not an IT survey. This is a digital health survey for an entire organization. This is intended to provide a great snapshot and benchmark for organizations to drive digital health, not digital technology. So as part of that, we measure in multiple er other areas, just other than just technology and some of those requirements. One of those areas is value-based care. Obviously, you would immediately think you don't think technology, but the reality is, as we look at this from a digital perspective, every single area from 19 to 20 improved across the board, across all of our provider organizations that put in there. On the whole, no one fell backwards in this perspective. That the reality is, in every single category, with exception of one at the bottom, and we love that that number went down, because that ad item actually is the one that says there were no capabilities. So the fact that there are no, that item of no capabilities is going down, then we think we're doing the right thing. We're driving that bar. Because everyone at this point wants value out of the care they're paying for. We hear about it in Washington. We hear about it from consumer groups. We hear about it from patients. And yes, every one of us feel that pain as well. So as we look for price transparency as examples, as this slide has, and we have many other ones that accompany this industry report, if you look at this just across the board, just something as simple as a list of procedures and services with associated pricing, that was unheard of a few years ago. But now 87% 80, of our organizations reporting say that they have some or all of their procedures and services with associated pricing listed out in a view for patients to see well before or provide that in some portal, app, or website. That's a significant change in the way care is being delivered and how we engage the patients proactively in this process because no one wants any surprises uh, with what is already very expensive care. Another example of population health is this overly busy slide and good news is we're gonna zoom in on it a little bit but just as important about population health is that process of engaging patients and clinicians in a process that creates wellness or at least helps people manage their care. 
and it's an activity completion um, requirement. We're gonna zoom into another slide here into these areas down here in particular, because these areas I think are very significant. These areas in particular are about the actual patient engagement and the actual clinical engagement. If you look at this, again, every single area we measure, we have seen significant improvement in that they are working in such ways that they actually are improving population health or through the engagement between the caregiver and those receiving care, sometimes also their family members. Truly targeting the right patients for those cares. Secure messaging among patients, caregivers, and care managers. What a huge opportunity, especially as you think about the fact so many people, obviously during this period of time, are at home. And what do they want? They don't want to have to leave their home to go get care or get messaging or get their, what they need. They're able to get it securely in their areas. Now, there's areas this brings up of concern, um, like digital divides and people that don't have the right equipment and or internet in their homes. That's an area I think we need to continue to focus on. And we'll see that in Washington as they continue to press on this. But the last area of patient engagement that really gives us great hope that's a huge swing from 40 to 70% in one year. Those using a full customer relation management system, a CRM, to manage and understand their patient population. What this means is the patient is moving to the center of the care continuum. It's becoming all about the care and all about the patient. And we're going to focus on all of their needs, whether that's how we outreach them, integrated record access, education programs, and yes, even making sure we're meeting their customer service needs. Great credit to the health systems, the physician offices, the long-term care organizations for taking this serious, because that's been a challenge for many, many years, and now we're seeing great improvement. But at the exact same time we're engaging patients, clinicians are engaging electronically as well in this population health continuum. They're looking for ways to find patient care gaps and statuses in a quick and meaningful way. They were doing that well, but they continue to improve. When you're almost near the top of a scale and you improve 4%, that's a lot, uh, and that's meaningful. But now even more so, physicians being actively engaged in quality measures, in quality, quality analytics, so they can see where there's opportunities for them and their teams to continue to improve. Look at that number change from 69% to 79% in one year is an absolutely uh, astounding number change in our industry. No different than the one before uh, below with clinicians being able to use the system now to track populations. What is population health? It's the ability to look at an aggregate group of people down to an individual level and do everything possible to keep them healthy, when they're not healthy, keep them out of the clinic. And when they're even more not healthy, keep them out of the hospitals. And the more we can do this, the more cost is care is affordable, but they also probably receive the best care proactively. And it's a great credit to our clinicians as we look at this for them to be able to manage this and see the improvements that we have. Part of this is also the ability for patients to engage, how they engage. Now, I'll be the first to admit, a couple of years ago, I was one of the biggest naysayers on patient portals. Uh, when we first rolled these out with government requirements, with the High Tech Act, and we couldn't even get 1% of patients to engage with a patient portal. Uh, we pretty much sent some pretty sour notes back to Washington on this initiative they were trying to drive us to. Well, little did we know how foundational that would be in a period of time when just about everybody was in a lockdown environment and really not mobile. And now the best way to get information is through a mobile device. And that's exactly what we've seen occur. Um, the technology was there, it was ready, and then there was a catalyst, in this case COVID, that really drove that. When you look at these raw numbers or these percentages that are on here, it's quite astounding when you think about it. 75% of organizations that answered our survey over 30,000 entities said that 25% or more of their patients accessed their patient portal information. Now that might have been to pay a bill, look at clinical results, in this case, maybe even looking for whether they're positive or negative on COVID. And that's astonishing. That is such a game changer because people won't go back once they are being engaged where they live and how they live, which is in their mobile and portable environment. So again, 
we've now seen a technology that maybe was a little before its time, now hit prime time, and we're so pleased to see that. At that same note, if you look at patient engagement and that patient portal access, why are they doing it? What are they doing? As you can see, once again from this chart, there is no turning back. Every single item on this, and we don't expect you to be able to see all of it on there, I'll point a few of them out, every single item except for the last one has improved. And the last one is the one we want to not improve or to, to, to decrease, and that's the no mobile app is available. And that went down considerably. Matter of fact, to the point where there almost isn't any left in the country that don't have the ability to engage in a mobile environment. But some of these numbers, like we said before, e-visits, virtual care going on, being able to text appointment reminders and then even change things as they come in. The ability to do click to call contact directory access, meaning I want to be able to connect with my doctor. I want my doctor to be able to connect with me in a fast and meaningful way. What we're seeing across the board, every single area is digital engagement with our patients, with our clinicians is improving. Again, an amazing statistic when you look at it from that perspective. Now, what I really like about that is it continues to show growth. And in this slide in particular, what we're showing here is that providers themselves are engaging in a process of using technology to improve clinical outcomes. How is that? They're receiving the right alerts, the right time, the right way, all the time. So if patients start turning, turning into a direction that's not a good thing in a hospital, alerts are firing immediately in critical care units, general medical, surgical units, more proactively with the right information to the right provider instead of just being a general alarm and a noise inside a unit for people to figure out. This is AI-based, this is artificial intelligence. This is driving to the point where the right alerts are actually improving care. What I love about this chart is every one of these trend lines is just a trend line. It doesn't happen because of COVID. It means that the quality of the systems are getting better. The alerts being provided to the clinicians are more meaningful and therefore the adoption curve is staying on the same track, which we would love to see this go up, continue to go up next year. Um, but again, as we point out, this is some amazing statistics that shows that healthcare can provide and the technology there can provide and assist providers in doing their jobs and maybe even taking a little bit of that mental and clinical load off of them uh, to assist them. Now, I'd be remiss if I didn't talk about one of those things that seems to be in the paper every single day, which is security, or as we refer to it, cyber. Uh, these areas continue to con uh, haunt organizations and be one of the most difficult things they deal with. Again, the good news is everybody continues to improve. Uh, the colors on the right, the ones that are yellow and orange, that's just to give you an idea of those that are higher performing, those with a comprehensive security program in their organization, having a CISO, a Chief Information Security Officer, who's really driving security strategy throughout that organization. As you can see there, they re either maintain steadiness and really good programs, or in many cases improved. And I think that's a credit to an industry that really is maybe a little behind in cybersecurity, but really trying to do its best to make sure it protects and keeps private the information and the resources of these organizations. I think the one concern we continue to see here is the number of organizations that really don't have a comprehensive security program yet. Many still don't have a dedicated or full-time CISO in their organization, and that is a concern because we know healthcare is a target, we know healthcare is vulnerable, just like every other sector of our economy and industry across the globe. This is an area we're gonna to continue to try to drive and try to point out that every program, every organization needs to have a comprehensive program in there. Cybersecurity is truly one of those areas that's the most critical for us uh, to continue to push on. Well, that's just a little bit of a snapshot, a little bit of a peek into that information. Uh, at Chime, uh, along with our partners Health, no different there, we have our own digital event coming up, which would have been our big in-person event in November. We call that Chime 20 Digital Recharge, because I think we all need a little bit of recharging after uh, what's been going on the last eight months. And so, as part of that program, we're gonna release the full industry trends report. That'll be available to the whole industry. That information will uh, be accessible in our electronic booth that is there, and we're gonna continue to try to drive the change 
by getting those results and the best practice reports out as much as we can. As you can see, a lot going on in that event, and we obviously wanna make sure those things occur. We've got some great leaders in that. Uh, we've got some great keynote speakers, but most importantly, one of the things we're really gonna to try to do this year, uh, not that we didn't do it in the past, but we're gonna really focus on it, is sharing as much best practice, real world, take this back to your organization, make a change with our guided track sessions, and some of our innovative events that we might have with some of the speakers you see on the slide there. The goal is to give people real world knowledge, results, and the ability to go back and make change rapidly in their organization, which is really one of our goals, obviously, uh, that we wanna make sure happens. So with that being said, we wanna make sure that we continue to push the bar up. You can't set new records if you don't raise the bar. If you just keep the bar where it is, then we start falling behind. And so our goal every year in the Most Wired program with our innovation programs and every, every program that we try to put out and engage with our members in the industry is to find a way to make healthcare a little bit safer, a little higher quality. And yes, we're gonna do everything we can to make it a little bit more affordable. So it is great to spend time. It's an honor again to follow Dr. Madeira and Dr. Reddy. Thank you so much for all you do for our industry and God bless. Thank you.